Very true. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for your presence here today. We ask that you open our hearts and minds and our ears to hear the message that you have placed upon us this day. We ask this so that we can continue to grow in your love and carry on the ministry of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a couple of props I'm going to use in just a minute, uh, but I want to talk a little bit first. We talk about lifting. We have this beautiful picture of an open hand. What happens when you close your hands? What do you form? A fist. A fist. What is a fist used for? Like fighting. Fighting. What is an open hand used for? Support. Support. Hugging. 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 Greeting one another, right? If you're Star Trek, you know, um, you can do this. Um, Captain Kirk would never do that. He always fumbled with his hands, but, you know, Spock would always do that. An open hand. Some of you were, when you were just singing before, you were standing and using your hands, open hands, praising, right? Lifting up. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And I want to talk specifically, I have a box. Now, it's not the box that we use every time, but this is my box that I have. And I brought this this way, just so I wouldn't break something. When we first started this series, we talked about the powder and the clay and being formed. And I told you about that bishop's retreat um, that I went to where there was the potter and he was doing all these things and then he smashed the clay and shocked all of us after he made this beautiful um, object. Well, he did bring some other things with him and so I thought uh, this is the chalice that, and I have a plate, you know, the patent for communion. And so I want to talk about holding the cup and what it means for us not to hold the cup but to lift the cup up and to be able to drink from the cup. This cup represents many things. When we think about this cup, first of all, our hands have to be open, right, in order to hold it. We can't, it's very hard to do that with, with fists, and I certainly don't want to drop this one, because I can't replace it, because I have no idea if this gentleman is still alive, he's in Tennessee someplace. So we have this cup. This cup represents so many things. It represents a cup of sorrows, it represents a cup of joy, it represents a cup of blessings, anguish, so many different things. When you first see this communion cup, this chalice, what do you think of? What first comes to your mind? Communion, right? The last, what we call the Last Supper, communion, or the Great Thanksgiving. There was another passage, though, in the Bible, too, that also talked about a cup. Does anybody remember what that is? happens when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. He says, he prays to God, he says, take this cup away from me. If you uh, know the superstar, take this cup away from me for I don't want to drink its poison, you know, it goes on with that. But the bottom line is, is we have this cup, and when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, he's anguishing over having to drink the cup in a sense of what the cup represented. Because this cup that he was going to drink was to bear all of our burdens, all of our sorrows, all of our sins, everything we did wrong. He was going to drink from that cup in order that we might have life and live abundantly. That we might have life and be in a relationship with God and with one another. So there was that anguish, but at the time, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke also says that there was an angel that came and nourished him, so to speak, strengthened him. So it also eventually becomes a cup of blessings. But when we think about communion, we think about the Last Supper usually first. And it was a time when Jesus was lifting up all of his disciples, wasn't he? He was lifting them up. He was telling them that this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for them and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he reminded them, to, whenever they drank of it, to think of him. And as he did that, when he said all that, he lifted the cup up and, and then he blessed it. 
And he was letting them know that we are all tied together, that we are a community, and when we are a community together, we can help one another through our joys and our sorrows, whatever it might be. So here is this cup that he offered to all of them to drink from, including Judas, who betrayed him. You see, God's grace was offered to everyone. And so we think of that cup, we think of what Jesus is trying to do was, was to help us understand what he was going to do for all of us. But it was also a chance for us to realize that if we all partake of it, we are bound together. So we have that, but there was another communion that we think of. You know, we always think of the, the Last Supper and then, you know, like the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane and then the crucifixion. So there's a cup of sorrow to mental, emotional, you know, physical, all sorts of strains and stresses. But there's also the cup of blessings and joy. This cup represents something more. Does anybody remember what the other kind of communion was? I'm walking. Anybody have an idea what that is? Walking? Walking to Emmaus? Emmaus. This is after Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, there were two men walking away from Jerusalem on their way back to Emmaus. And they were struggling because they had just lost the Messiah. They had just lost Jesus. Jesus had been crucified. And then they heard the body had been stolen, or they didn't know what the tomb was empty, right? And so Jesus is walking along with them, but they didn't recognize him. It was just a stranger, and so the hour was getting late, so what did they do? They invited him to stay with them. And so he came and stayed with them, started to stay with them, and there was a chance when he broke the bread, and there was a cup, and they recognized who he was. And then he disappeared. And so what do these people do? These two men, even though the hour is late, they leave the base and they run back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples, to tell all those that were still behind the locked doors of the upper room that they had seen the Lord, they had seen the Messiah. So this couple also represents resurrection. We're resurrection people, aren't we? Yes. And so this is a cup of joy and a cup of blessings. So it's just something else that we can hold on to and celebrate and be thankful for that Jesus showed us not only the sorrow, but he also showed us the joy. So we first held the cup, and we saw what it meant to hold the cup. And then we talked about what might the inside of the cup represents. Any burdens that we have, any anguish, any despair, but it also inside is hope and joy and love and compassion. And so we put all that into the cup and we lift it up to God. We lift it up so that we can give all that to God. And we realize that when we do that, there's others who will connect with us and join us in sharing whether it's sorrows, we have somebody that will help lift us up and maybe give us some hope. And whether it's a joy, don't we celebrate? Last week, we just had an incredible blessing and baptism of a very cute little boy, you know, by the name of Benjamin. I mean, so wasn't that a joy? We had that. So we had these two things that we talked about, you know, holding the cup, putting all those things inside the cup, letting all that, and talking about the joy and, and, the, and the hope and everything. And then, when we lift the cup, when we lift the cup up, we're inviting others to join with us to affirm our life together, okay, and celebrate that as a gift from God. When we hold our cup of, full of life, of sorrows and joys, and lifting it up for others to see, it encourages others, okay? It encourages others to lift up their lives as well. And hopefully they will grow into a community of believers along with us. Our fellowship that we have provides a place to visibly share our joys and our sorrows. It helps us to realize that we're not alone. We are bound together. We are here together. 
So we're not isolated, we're not alone. We are all here together. Now, if you think about uh, mosaic, you know, like the tiles, I was telling someone the other day, I once made a job much harder for myself than I should have. When I was little, I got one of those kits where you can put all the mosaic tiles and then you put the ground in, you know, and I made something for my grandmother. Now, it would have only taken me five minutes to do it if I probably looked at the directions. But, you know, I was little at the time. And so, you know, it was a nice square of all these individual tiles, but they were already woven together. So all I had to do was stick it in this metal tray and then put the ground on it. But I didn't know that. So what did I do? I took out each tile off this very nicely grid. And then I tried to place all the tiles individually into this metal tray and then grout it. Okay? Needless to say, it wasn't as neat and as organized, and there were some gaps, so it didn't form exactly what I was hoping it to. Now, of course, my grandmother loved it, and she was my grandmother, but it was kind of missing a few spots there, and there was a lot of grout in certain places and no tile. Oh, it would have been so much easier if I had just read the directions. But if we think about all the individual tiles, that you know, if we were each an individual tile, we each have different images. But when you put it together, and if you look at it from far away, it forms a picture, doesn't it? You know, the closer you get, you get to see all the individual things. But when you're further away, you see another picture all put together. And I think that's what we're trying to talk about, being bound together, is that we, whether we are considered a tile, which we're really not, but I mean, if we look at that as an example, as a symbol, we realize that we form a community, and we become part of this mosaic of Christ. We become part of this body of Christ. But we know that if the tile is missing, right, then the image isn't complete, is it? And I think that we still have more tiles that we can fit into our community of faith. I think we still have more room for that. And I'm hoping that as we continue to grow, that we will continue to add and make our mosaic bigger and bigger and bigger because as a community of faith we can do that. So Jesus had us he had, had us hold the cup we put all of our things inside the cup we lifted the cup up the next thing is drinking from the cup, right? Now I know we do a communion by invitation, we dip the bread in there but if we were to drink from this cup are we willing to, when we drink, to accept the call that God has placed on our individual lives? That's what it is to drink from the cup. It is saying, yes, God, I receive your grace. I embrace the grace you give me. And I'm here to serve. Right? Jesus talked about not being greater than others. He talked about instead of being so great and mourning over others, we must serve others. That's what we call servant leadership today. The last will be first, the first will be last. You heard that mentioned a little bit in the gospel, too. So, my question to you is, are you ready to drink from this cup? Are you ready to embrace what God is calling you to do? What God is calling you to be? Are you ready to go out into the world, lifting your cup up with others? Are you ready to trust in God's infinite love for you and freely drink from this cup? Emptying it of some of the sorrows and joys, but allowing God to then fill it with love and salvation. Are you ready to drink from this cup and receive the new life that God is offering you? The next time we have communion, I invite you to put your hope, your faith, and your trust in God. And when you dip the bread into the cup, embrace the love and salvation that God offers you.